All right, so in this module, we're gonna switch over to the phase transformations chapter, which is applying a lot of what we talk about in the phase diagram chapter uh, and talking about specifically all of these transformations and what is needed for them to occur. And so this first module uh, in this chapter, we're going to talk about supercooling. All right, so uh, I'm not going to play this video here. Um, I have a separate video uh, that I've actually showed before in the polymer chapter, and it's those spherulites uh, that nucleate and grow uh, from PEG 3350. So I'll actually put that video um, in the module page for this so you can take a look at it um, if you want. Uh, but you might have already taken a look at it. So let's talk about these transformations. And let's look at kind of going back to a simple um, phase diagram, which is that isomorphous, right? So we have a liquid, a liquid plus uh, a solid, and then pure solid below. So for a phase to transform, such as a liquid freezing into a solid, um, there has to be a driving force for that to occur. It can't just happen uh, randomly, right? So it's only we're only going to have alpha form um, if we're below the liquidus, right? Because below the liquidus, it says we should have alpha here and here, right? So that's our driving force. So our driving force is the phase diagram tells us that that should exist at that given temperature. And what we find is that this driving force um, usually, uh, as the temperature decreases, um, the driving force increases below the temperature. So the further we are away from the liquidus, right, further down, the higher the driving force is going to be because it's like saying we should have more and more alpha, right? So the driving force is bigger because we uh, are in a region that's more and more stable for the alpha phase. And so what we see is that what we call what we call supercooling um, is kind of a measure of that concept. Uh, supercooling is the temperature below the equilibrium freezing temperature for this or the melting temperature, right? So it's basically the melting temperature, if we're talking about solidification, minus the temperature below that we're at. And so that's the delta T for difference in temperature. And so we call that the supercooling or degree of supercooling. So it's how far uh, away from TM are we? And so when we're right at the equilibrium temperature, and so this is zero, then the driving force for this solidification process, forming of solid, uh, the driving force for nucleation, which just is a fancy word of saying to form those particles, is very low. So it's not really likely to occur um, at these temperatures that are at the melting. So we need a larger degree of supercooling because the driving force continues to increase and increase. And I actually put a similar example here, but this is kind of the opposite temperature range. So imagine we have liquid water. So liquid water should be liquid um, below 100 degrees Celsius, right? Above 100 degrees, it says it should boil, right? Um, however, above 100 degrees, um, a lot of times you can still have liquid water. Um, and so this is an example where water is being heated. Uh, you can actually do this in the microwave. It's actually uh, not uh, super safe to do this, but um, if you've ever done this before where you put water in a microwave uh, and you look at the temp or you find out the temperature is actually above 100 degrees, but you still haven't boiled that water. Um, one reason for that is because the temperature needs to be higher for or superheated above 100 um, for it to boil. Um, and then what you do is you can actually see that um, if you add something like a, a surface, that it can start to boil. And it's again, it's uh, above 100 degrees. So not even though we say the equilibrium temperatures are at a 
certain point, it doesn't always mean that those are where the reactions are going to occur. Uh, it can happen above if we're talking about this boiling phenomenon, and most likely for metal or for solidification, it happens below at a given degree of supercooling. All right, so now we want to look at what goes in to this phase transformation. So, and it's governed by two separate phenomena. The first one, nucleation, and the second one, growth, which we'll talk about in a bit. But to start with nucleation, again, nucleation is basically the start of it. So a nuclei is like a seed crystal. So it's like a template in which the, the crystal will continue to grow and grow. So basically, it's just like a small amount of the material. So that's all a nuclei is. So um, for a nucleus to form the rate of addition of atoms to the nucleus must be faster than the loss, right? That's just kind of, if we have a solid here, um, it's got to attach faster than it has to give up in order for there to be a nuclei. So once it's nucleated, then growth can proceed um, until some type of equilibrium is reached. So the first part is forming a small amount of, and then we continue to grow based on that. So in this case, we're kind of modeling this reaction uh, with this light color is the liquid, and then we fall, form a small sphere of radius r. It's going to have a given surface area uh, between which, uh, our, uh, which is the interface between this solid particle, the orange, and the liquid, which is the lighter orange out here. And there's also going to be a volume, obviously, attached to this. So again, like we said, the driving force to nucleate increases as we increase the delta T or supercooling, right? So that means as we decrease the temperature. So we going back to, oops, sorry, going back to the original one, right? It's decreasing the temperature so that the delta below this liquidus or melting um, is higher. So that's what we're talking about here. So that is supercooling. Uh, which we see with the uh, the eutectic and the eutectoid reactions, and then um, the converse kind of phenomenon of superheating that we talked about, that could be tied to uh, paratectic reactions, um, increasing those to go from the uh, solid and liquid to uh, solid at lower temperatures. All right, so on top of needing the supercooling to occur, supercooling also controls the final grain size of a material. And let's kind of see how that um, looks. So we know that at low or small supercoolings, so the delta T is small, that the nucleation rate, the driving force is low. And so that means we're gonna get only a few of these nuclei so it's going to look something like this. So if this is our microstructure, of these are the little nuclei, and then the white is the liquid. So what happens here is that because we only have a, a few nuclei, they're going to, uh, when they grow, they're going to grow much larger before they impede on the other crystals, because there's only a few of these grains, right? However, in the opposite scenario where we have a large delta T or supercooling, that's going to be a high driving force, which means we have a rapid nucleation rate. So we have many nuclei. So it's going to look like this as opposed to this, right? So all of these are the little nuclei. And here, when they grow, th they'll still grow, but they'll impede on another grain much more quickly. And so you'll get something like this, right? Because they're basically consuming the liquid around them. And so they can only do it until they encounter another grain. And since there's a lot more grains, they will grow to smaller sizes. So this is a frequent um, uh, connection between supercooling and the final grain size. So that's something that you want to consider when we look at the, these nucleation rates. All right, so it's important to stress that this nucleation phenomenon, what we talked about here with uh, a sphere of that solid forming in a liquid is known as homogeneous nucleation because it just forms from the bulk of the liquid metal or whatever the material is. 
And so this type of nucleation uh, requires typically a lot of supercooling, so a very low temperature compared to the melting. So this could be a, a, a 80 or even 300 degrees below that equilibrium temperature. So that's a lot. However, there's actually another form of nucleation, which is much more common, and that's known as heterogeneous nucleation. And what that is, is what we kind of see down here. It's the solid forming from the liquid around it, but the solid forms on some type of surface or interface. So this is the nucleating surface that I talk about right here. So there's a number of things this could be. So if we're casting a material, this could be the mold wall, right? So whatever the uh, container is, it could be on the surface of that mold wall. Um, it could actually be some type of impurity, like a speck of dust or some type of particle, right? It could be a number of things. It could be uh, things that you purposely add in uh, for nucleation purposes. Um, and so this is a much more common phenomenon that we see this occur. And it, the reason we see this is because it only requires slight supercooling. So uh, as low as 0.1 degree up to 10 degrees. So much more... Uh, uh, much te closer temperatures to the equilibrium. And so this is typically what we see as more common. And that's why if you kind of think back to, let's go back to the example I showed you with the superheating, right? So this is why the water above 100 didn't boil until we put this sort of ball in there because the ball acted as a surface in which it could nucleate at uh, those temperatures. So that's why we see that phenomenon occur uh, because we have heterogeneous nucleation occur in this instance. All right. So in the next section, we're going to look at sort of the energy around forming nucleation and how we can derive some expressions to uh, discuss this.